Sounds good. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everyone. Uh, hopefully you guys are able to see that. Um, and I'll get the chat up. Okay. So, like I said, I'll be talking about psychopathology, uh, which is just a really, really condensed introduction to the study of mental illness. Um, and uh, like, like we went over, um, generally I'll be answering questions at the end of the talk. Uh, and if people have a lot of questions, I'm happy to hang back for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes after the talk ends um, and keep answering questions. Um, I will sometimes be asking to get some feedback from from you all, and uh, if you can type that into the chat um, when I prompt you for some answers, um, just in the same way that you did to let us know where everyone was coming from, uh, that would be great. So um, I am currently a postdoc at Stanford. Uh, I next year will be starting, or this coming year, will be starting as a professor at UC Santa Cruz. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna first ask a couple really zoomed out questions. What is a mental illness? How do you quote unquote get a mental illness? And then what we'll do is go in more specifically to uh, a few different types of mental illnesses uh, to get a sense of what they might look like. So first this question, what is a mental illness? So this is gonna be our first chat question. So type, your, type into the chat any thoughts you have on this. What makes us label certain behavior as a mental illness versus label it as normal or subclinical um, and as not a mental illness? What are kind of the, the giveaways that might suggest that something is a mental illness? No wrong answer here, just any thoughts that you guys have. Chemical imbalance, inconsiderate behavior, lack of self-control. Okay. There's maladaptive behavior, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, you guys captured a, a few of these in, in your answers actually, but we sort of summarize what makes us label something as a mental illness into what's often referred to as the three Ds. Um, so the first one is distress. Uh, and so that can be either personal distress, like someone who has depression, who's very upset about it, or anxiety, where it's very hard to get things done, leave the house. Um, but there are other kinds of mental illness where the individual might not be distressed, but they are making people around them and in their community very distressed. A classic example of that would be psychopathy, which is another term for antisocial personality disorder. Um, so classic characters like the Joker might arguably um, have psychopathy. Uh, and they are causing distress for people around them, even if not themselves. So distress is the first one. Dysfunction is the second. So always a way that we sort of know whether we would uh, say this is a mental illness versus just sort of, you know, lying, lying on the more normal end of the spectrum is if symptoms are getting in the way of our lives. Uh, so dysfunction examples might be if you're not getting out of bed, someone maybe has lost their job because they missed so many shifts at work because they were so depressed and staying in bed for so long. So that's um, the second D, dysfunction. Uh, and then the third D is deviance. Um, and so deviance uh, refers to just that it is deviant from the norm for our specific culture. Um, as an example of this, back in Roman times, the Romans uh, built these very lavish dining tables. They would have couches around the tables. They would have these long, long dinner parties and they would eat so much food that they would get really, really full and have to go outside and make themselves vomit in order to keep eating. Nowadays, we might call that binge eating disorder or bulimia. At the time though, because it was culturally normative, it wasn't deviant and so we would not label it as a mental illness, okay? So that, that's the, the third D. The, the question of deviance, I think, is a really interesting one uh, because deviance, it's constantly changing and it's also subjective. It's not black and white. Uh, it, and, and yeah, it does, it changes a lot over time. Um, some things that help us determine whether something is deviant, and I should mention also, I don't mean deviant in the sort of criminally deviant way. I literally just mean deviating from the norm off of the average. So one of the things uh, that, that we use to consider whether something's deviant are the social norms for your culture. Um, so the example with the Romans was an example of that. Uh, another example is there is a culture in Indonesia that has a celebration where one day every year, they dig up a bunch of loved ones' corpses, walk them around, dress them up, hang out with them for the day, um, and then put them back. 
Um, so that is very normal for that culture on that day. Uh, if someone were to walk into whatever room you're in right now holding a corpse um, in a way that was not socially normative for that culture, um, that would be deviant behavior and might be indicative of a mental illness. Another way we know if something's deviant are, is by considering the specific characteristics of the person. So for example, if you have a three-year-old throwing a temper tantrum, that's not necessarily deviant for that age. However, if you have a 30-year-old throwing a temper tantrum, that is more deviant, might suggest mental illness. And then the third consideration for, uh, for deviance is the context. So if you have a soldier who is overseas at war and they are sort of constantly looking over their shoulder, feeling very vigilant and sort of paranoid about um, being attacked at any minute, uh, in the context of the situation they're in, that would not be deviant, right? That's actually perhaps pretty adaptive. But if then they come home and they're back taking college courses and they're still feeling like I'm about to get attacked, I'm constantly looking over my shoulder, um, that would be deviant behavior in the context of being back at college. So those are all three considerations. The way that we classify, and by we I mean kind of psychology as a field, um, classify different mental illnesses is through the DSM-5. Um, the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's often referred to as the Bible of psychiatry or psychology. Um, and it lumps disorders into different categories. So you've got your anxiety disorders, mood disorders, psychotic disorders, uh, many, many pages, 500 plus pages of different disorders. It gets updated every five to 20 years. Um, so this picture shows stacked DSM two through four. And you can kind of see with each version, it's getting bigger and bigger. We're generally adding things rather than taking them away. To go back to this idea that what we label as normal versus abnormal is constantly changing, uh, uh, the DSM updates as norm changes as, as norms change as well. So for example, homosexuality was actually included in the DSM until uh, the 70s and was taken out then as people's sort of understanding of that and cultural norms changed around that. Another case of it updating is it used to be the case that uh, if you were, if you had all the symptoms of depression, but in the context of a loved one recently dying, that couldn't be classified as depression because there was what was called a bereavement clause where the symptoms sort of didn't count if it was in the context of recently losing um, a loved one. That clause was taken out. Um, so now uh, someone who has lost a loved one um, can meet criteria for depression. So it's just another example of it updating. And that one was, was more contentious um, than removing homosexuality. So it's constantly changing in various ways, uh, including those. What the DSM tries to do is, uh, for better or for worse, is kind of carve uh, the actual normal spectrum of behavior and make it categorical. So we can probably, if we think about sort of how depression lies along the spectrum, we can probably all relate to this idea of feeling down for a couple hours after something like losing a soccer game. Probably most of us can also relate to a higher level of depression, like having trouble eating and sleeping for a week or so after a devastating breakup. And then over here, we've got, you know, this more extreme presentation of depression, losing your job after missing five shifts because you were too depressed to get out of bed. And what the DSM tries to do is sort of carve this line where it says, okay, if symptoms are roughly worse than this, we're gonna label it as a mental illness. If they are not as bad as, as crossing over this threshold, um, then we won't. And so it, it can get criticized for trying to kind of carve things up in that way um, that doesn't quite map onto how they are in nature. Um, but yeah, that categorical approach is, is kind of what it does. So uh, DSM diagnoses might sound like this. Um, this is the DSM description for a major depressive episode, which is um, basically for depression. Um, so I won't read it to you, but go ahead and read. So you need at least five of the following nine symptoms. And you have to have depressed mood or loss of interest and pleasure in activity. Take a minute to read through those. And the fact that you have to have five out of the nine speaks to the variability of what depression can look like. You know, some people might have one through five, other people might have one and then six through nine. Um, so a different set of symptoms, even though it's kind of classified as the same disorder. Symptoms must be present for at least two weeks in this case, and they must be interfering with getting things done in some way um, or cause really significant distress. All right. so. I want to hear your thoughts. Type, type in a chat if you have thoughts about this. What, what do you think are the benefits 
of having a system like the DSM and what might be some drawbacks of having it. You can think, think about this for, you know, 20 seconds or so. Type in any thoughts that you have, um, benefits or drawbacks. Agreement on what a particular diagnosis means. Yep, yeah, I think that's a big benefit of it, right? Because we, we want clinicians um, in, say, different parts of the country to be able to have a common language. Uh, so if someone in California says, I have a patient with OCD, we want another clinician in Chicago to know what they mean. Um, and also, I think that captures that agreement on what a particular diagnosis means. Uh, that kind of captures that, in theory, it's trying to make diagnosis um, more objective, right? So that people aren't just saying like, oh, it feels like this person's depressed. It's, you know, uh, do they meet these different criteria? Non-benefits, misunderstanding of symptoms. Okay. Um, say more about, say more about what you mean by misunderstanding of symptoms. See if we can get more detail on that. We got different therapists. Generally, common understanding and communicate together. Yep. So that common that common language that they can share. Downside: some people may not fit the normal pattern, but still have issues. Yeah. Right. So what am I supposed to do if I sort of almost meet criteria for depression and I'm pretty upset, but I only have four out of those nine criteria that we just went over, right? Does that mean that I'm fine and I shouldn't get treatment? Um, that's kind of a drawback of the categorical approach. Oh, okay, so yeah, clarification, not being in the person's shoes since the person has never been depressed. Yeah, right, so remember this book, I think that's a good point. This book was written by people generally who don't have all of these disorders. I'm sure some of the people who wrote this book did, um, but it can be sort of hard to maybe explain or, or list out these symptoms without having experienced them uh, themselves. All right, good thoughts, everyone. So um, we'll next move on to this question of how do you get a mental illness? I get asked this a lot. Uh, we'll talk about it in broad strokes, not specific to any one mental illness. Um, the general way that we think of getting a mental illness is uh, summarized in the diathesis stress model. So diathesis is sort of this idea that you come into a situation with a vulnerability, a lot of which is accounted for by your genetics that you're born with. That's kind of more of the nature side of things. And the stress side is that bad things happen. So that's the nurture or environmental side of things. And together, those two combine to increase risk for psychiatric disorders broadly. One thing we know in terms of environmental influences is that severe early life stress is generally bad. So that includes things like neglect or abuse, the death of a parent, living in an orphanage, um, or any kind of early trauma such as witnessing a murder at a young age. These are all going to increase risk for psychiatric disorders. I'll show you kind of a, a zoomed in um, case study of how stress and diathesis interact. Um, we're gonna think about the serotonin transporter gene. Um, so this gene has two alleles, basically two versions. So you can have a total of three different combinations of it. So each person is either, and the S stands for short, the L stands for long. So you can be either short, 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 long, or long, long, depending on which allelic combination you were born with. And so a study looked at how stressful events across people's 20s were associated with depression risk, depending on which of those three allele combinations they were born with. And so we can, we can look at this here. Um, if you look at on this graph, um, all the way to the left, uh, the y-axis there, you can see three kind of little dots on it. And that shows the likelihood of developing depression if you've had no stressful life events in your 20s. And as you can see, all three of those groups are hovering around 10%. They're not really very different from each other. However, um, as the number of stressful life events increases, as you might expect, risk for depression increases. However, it increases more depending on which allelic combination you have. So sort of the most unfortunate combination is that short short, where after having four stressful life events, your risk for depression is around 40%. Whereas if you have long long, uh, your risk tops out at around 20%. So stress is increasing risk for everybody, but it's increasing it more for those, those folks born with the short short allelic combination. So that's just one example of the diathesis stress model and how it might look. 
Um, another way that we can think about uh, the way environment influences our mental health is thinking about how our physical health environment um, can influence our psychology. So I think it's always important to remember that the brain is an organ in our body, just like our heart and our lungs. Um, it's, of course, a very different organ. I would argue a very special organ, um, but it is an organ. And so uh, it, that kind of explains why a lot of us get grumpy when we don't eat. Um, I certainly do grumpy when we don't sleep enough. Um, that definitely happens to me as well. And we'll look at a couple mechanisms of how this might work because I think they're kind of neat. Uh, so we kind of generally have a sense that if we don't sleep, we're grumpy, like we just said, right? Um, and uh, sleep, a loss of sleep can also be associated with a variety of different mental illnesses. Um, and so this image shows uh, glial channels in the brain. So basically when the brain is working, when we're thinking, when we're doing stuff, when we're going about our day, the brain is constantly producing this toxic metabolic byproduct and the glial channels then are flushing that out constantly. Glial channels, um, which are shown in blue in this image, actually expand their diameter by about 60% during sleep. Um, so they get bigger, they can flush more of that metabolic byproduct out. When we have too much buildup of that byproduct, um, our cognition gets fuzzy, we, uh, we're not as good at remembering things, we can't think as clearly. And it seems like also we're not able to regulate our emotions as well. That's the side effect of that metabolic byproduct buildup. So the glial channels, which are clearing that out, are able to do their job more effectively when we're asleep. So one mechanistic explanation for why loss of sleep um, can you know, affect, our, affect our mood. Exercise is another thing like that. We sort of intuitively might note that we feel better um, emotionally when we exercise. One explanation for that um, might also be uh, visible in the brain. And so this was a study um, with uh, mice, and actually the last study was a mouse brain as well, um, but it's believed to work similarly in humans. Um, so for, for this study, uh, half of the mice didn't get any exercise, and half of the mice got a bunch of exercise. So they did a bunch of aerobics on their little mouse wheel. Um, they then looked at neurogenesis in the brain. And so neurogenesis is just the growth and development of nervous tissue. And so the images that are shown there, um, I'll orient you specifically to the black and white image to the left. Um, the black dots in that show the growth of new neural tissue over the course of this study. So the no exercise group had a little bit of neurogenesis. Um, sure, maybe not a ton. The group that got aerobic exercise, this is what a snapshot of one of their brains looked like where you can just see from that black and white image, I think the best, you can see that growth and development of new nervous tissue that's happening a lot more in the exercise group. Again, this is believed to be a mechanism through which uh, exercise helps us to um, regulate our emotions as well. We're sort of able to, our brains are, are functioning better when we're exercising. All right, so um, the, we now kind of ask these broad questions of what is a mental illness and how you get a mental illness We'll next go into some specific types of mental illness uh, to give ourselves a sense of what different mental illnesses look like. So we'll talk about depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and OCD. Um, it's a crash course on all of them. Uh, like I said, happy to answer more questions at the end. I'm sure you guys are going to be left with a lot of questions about them. I hope you are, in fact. I hope you're left with a bunch. So um, yeah, let's see. Those are the four we'll go over. We'll start with depression. Uh, we already read the DSM description of depression, where you saw that it's kind of a mix of mood symptoms as well as some physiological symptoms like insomnia or overeating, um, could also include thoughts of suicide. Um, and so this graph uh, is just kind of a mock-up that I made showing sort of different types of depression. So this graph shows, let's say, a non-clinical person where they're still kind of ups and downs. Sometimes they're happier, sometimes they're sadder. Uh, but generally, they're kind of in, in this more limited range. Their mood is in a more limited range. This shows a single episode of major depressive disorder where people dip into feeling really, really down um, for at least a few weeks, sometimes up to a few months, sometimes even up to a few years. Um, Depression is considered episodic. So people can go through an episode and can kind of recover back up to baseline uh, and feel roughly like their normal selves. Um, with each episode, the likelihood of having another episode increases. So if I've had one major depressive episode, there's a 50% chance that I'll never have another one, but a 50% chance that I will. But if I've had, you know, six or seven depressive episodes, then the likelihood that I have, you know, a seventh or eighth uh, is, is pretty high. Um, it's pretty likely that I'm, that I'm going to get depressed again. 
Um, this line shows what we call dysthymia um, or persistent depressive disorder, uh, where it's not quite as depressed as major depressive disorder, but it's sort of just this chronic feeling down, feeling hopeless um, for years on end, many years on end. And then the sort of most unfortunate combination uh, is what we refer to as double depression. Um, in this case, the graph shows recurrent episodes um, of that where even someone's baseline that they get back up to is still dysthymic. So they're falling into major depressive episodes but only ever getting back up to um, still a pretty low mood. Um, so you can type in a chat, does anyone know what we call uh, depression if the episode happens right after giving birth? Yep, postpartum. And then what about um, if an episode happens every winter? What do we tend to call that? Yeah, SAD or seasonal affective disorder. And so those are the names that we generally refer to them, um, but they're both depression. Um, they're, they're both, it's just the timing of when the depressive episodes happen um, that makes us label them differently. All right, um, in terms of the heritability of depression, it's got about a 40% heritability estimate. What that means is that 40% of the variance in uh, who gets depressed or not is accounted for by genetics. Um, comparatively, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are around 80% heritability, so they are much more genetically linked than depression. That said, if you have severe early onset and recurrent depression, so sort of like a worse version of, of depression, um, then the heritability estimate is around 75%, which is more similar um, to those other uh, kind of genetic, more genetically linked disorders. The serotonin system um, is really implicated in depression. Um, so the way neurons work is they release uh, a bunch of neurotransmitter um, into the synapse, which is kind of the gap between neurons shown here. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with, with this type of image. Uh, so one of those neurotransmitters is serotonin. Um, and the, the way that we treat depression with medication is often through selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. So that's things like Paxil, Prozac um, that you may have heard of. A lot of antidepressants are SSRIs. And what they do is they try and prevent that serotonin from getting uh, kind of sucked back up from the neuron that released it so that more serotonin can be sitting in the synapse in order to result in um, the neuron that it's going to, uh, you know, catching it, so to speak, and, and firing it. So try and keep more, more serotonin in the synapse of the brain. Um, and that seems to be a, a major system that is maintaining depressive symptoms, um, which seems to be why uh, it works to treat depression with antidepressants. A psychological treatment for depression is called, the, the one that's sort of the gold standard is called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Um, and I'll do a, a quick overview of how you might uh, apply CBT to depression. Um, so CBT is really rooted in um, this quote that I like, Epictetus said, people are not disturbed by things, but by the view they take of them. And so following that, uh, you kind of think about what that, what that quote means. Um, following that, if we can shift our thoughts around, um, the C in CBT stands for cognitive, which is synonymous for thoughts. So if we can shift our cognitions around, then we can create lasting emotional and behavioral changes. Because, you know, it's this idea that it's not the things themselves that matter, it's sort of what we think about them that influences our emotions. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of that, right? So it's the interpretations, not the events that influence our mood. As an example, let's say you're walking down the sidewalk, you see a friend walking on the other side of the street, walking towards you, uh, and you know, you're kind of waiting to wave to the friend, waiting to wave, and you look at them, you look at them, and they kind of glance at you and look away and keep on walking. What's one interpretation, you can type it into chat, what's one interpretation that you might have of that situation? How might you interpret that friend looking at you, looking away and continuing to walk? They're rude or unfriendly, right? Okay, and they don't remember you. So we've got two really different interpretations already up there, um, which is great. Um, so right, one interpretations, yes, yeah, so they're not my friend anymore, they're avoiding me, they're rude. And then you're gonna feel pretty upset. A totally different interpretation. So we got someone said they don't, um, or I guess they don't remember you could also sort of make you upset. What, what's a, could be, could be preoccupied. Yeah, they could be preoccupied. 
Um, maybe even that friend just didn't see you. And then you're gonna feel pretty okay about the situation. So on one hand, you might interpret, you know, this person's rude, they're avoiding me, they don't like me. On the other hand, they're busy, they didn't see me. Same exact event, a friend that doesn't wave to you, but the interpretation really changes your emotional reaction to it. So people with depression often have what we call thought distortions, where their thoughts have gotten really out of touch with reality. Um, we have the phrase, seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. People with depression are almost seeing the world through blue-colored glasses. Um, and so we can label thought distortions into a few common categories. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just examples. One common type of thought distortion um, that people with depression uh, experience a lot is catastrophizing, aka fortune-telling. And that's just predicting that negative events are going to happen um, while discounting the likelihood that positive events happen. So something like, I'm never going to meet a boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, mind reading is another type. So that's assuming that you know what others are thinking. So that might sound something like, he thinks I'm a loser um, without necessarily having any evidence of this. It's feeling convinced that uh, you kind of know that people think poorly of you or are thinking, um, yeah, thinking negatively about you. Uh, all or nothing, aka black and white thinking, um, is another common distortion. So that's, as you might expect, thinking about things in all or nothing terms. So I have no friends. It's not like I only have a few close friends, I could have more. It's I have no friends. Or if I don't get an A, then I'm a total failure. Um, a B or a C isn't, you know, kind of okay but needs improvement. Uh, it's just A or failure, black or white. Um, so we'll do a little exercise, type into chat here. Um, I'll show you some examples of thoughts that someone might have and just type in which of those three you think it might be. So let's say a kid comes to you and says, my teacher didn't say nice job at the end of my presentation. He must have thought it was dumb. Which of those would this be? Fortune telling, mind reading, black and white thinking. Mind reading, yes. Um, what about this one? I just know I'm not gonna get into uh, a good college. What would that be? Fortune telling, yep. And uh, my friend forgot about my birthday. She's a worthless friend, absolutely worthless. What would that be? Black and white thinking, yeah. It's not like, oh, she's a friend who messed up this one time. Um, she's worthless. And then last, uh, the class definitely noticed that I was shaking when I talked. What's that sound like? Yeah, mind reading, yeah. Um, and of course, many thoughts can be a mix of all of the above. Um, CBT thinks of 12 different thought distortions. These are just three of them. Okay, so that's our crash course in depression. We'll next move on to um, bipolar disorder. Um, and so bipolar disorder like depression is a mood disorder. The DSM-5 describes the criteria for a manic episode, um, which is kind of the cardinal experience of bipolar disorder. People get manic. Um, so mania is a period of elevated, expansive, or irritable mood for at least one week. And I, I don't mean just a little bit elevated. Um, I mean sort of total euphoria. Um, people can have ver very grandiose beliefs, like that they're going to be able to cure cancer um, in the next month, that kind of thing. I'll let you read through those. These are the other criteria. Um, three or more of the following. The four or more if irritable, just as if, if mania is irritable only and not kind of euphoric, um, then people need to have more symptoms to, to conclude that it's mania. But yeah, so you might have a mix of that inflated self-esteem, uh, racing thoughts. These are some of the different criteria here. This is a long quote, I realize, um, but I think it's a good one. Uh, so Kay Jamison is a researcher, she's a professor, uh, at I believe UOC, um, who studies bipolar disorder and also has it. And so this is her description of a manic episode. I'll give everyone, um, you know, a minute or so to read through this.
Okay, so we think that this quote, like I said, nicely captive, captures uh, what a manic episode can feel like. People, when manic, often do things that they later come to regret. Um, they might spend thousands of dollars that they don't have. Um, they might uh, engage in sexual relationships that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, people can be sort of uh, impulsive and erratic in ways that are out of character for them. So we'll go back to this graph to kind of compare uh, different types of bipolar disorder. Um, so again, this is our non-clinical person, doesn't have mental illness, just kind of normal variations in mood. Um, this is bipolar one disorder. So this is people are both manic, that's that kind of elated high euphoric feeling. Uh, and then generally they often experience depressive episodes as well. Some people with bipolar one disorder only experience manic episodes, don't ever experience depressive episodes, but the vast majority um, experience both. Uh, bipolar 2 is a different kind um, where people have what's called hypomania, which is sort of like a, a miniature mania um, or a less severe mania. Uh, and then they do also have depressive episodes as well. So the general picture for bipolar disorder, both types, is kind of fluctuating between feeling down and depressed and feeling kind of high and manic. Um, people may go months or years in between a manic or depressive episode and be, and be sort of fine, especially um, when they are treated with mood stabilizers like lithium. Um, that's a really useful treatment for bipolar disorder. Um, but yeah, generally they will uh, experience these two kinds of mood episodes. So causes of bipolar disorder generally believed to be a pretty strong genetic influence um, and uh, it is treated best with medication um, more so than with therapy. Um, triggers for mania though, environmental triggers do include uh, rewarding activities. So sometimes people if they get a new job or they finish final exams or something like that, that can sometimes spiral people up into mania. Um, and another trigger for mania is sleep loss. So actually people with bipolar disorder in therapy are really encouraged to um, regulate their sleep, make sure that they don't, you know, go a few nights in a row of only getting four hours or so of sleep because that in itself can trigger a manic episode. Once manic, people often um, aren't sleeping very much anyways, even though they're very energetic. They might only be sleeping two or three hours a night, um, but then be able to be up all day. Um, but yeah, it, it does work in, in that direction as well. Losing sleep can initiate mania. All right, so um, those are the two mood disorders we're gonna cover. We'll next move on to a different type of disorder, schizophrenia, which is a psychotic disorder. Um, so schizophrenia includes um, two or more of the following five symptoms. I'll go over what all these five are, what I mean by them. Um, and like we see with depression, you know, the presentation of schizophrenia can, can vary somewhat um, since you only need to have two of these five. So delusions. Um, delusions are fixed beliefs about something that are not based in reality. So classic examples might be believing that the CIA is out to get you, um, believing that you're God, believing that uh, people can read your mind, um, believing that a chip is implanted into your brain and is controlling, controlling your actions. Those are all examples of common delusions. Um, so again, it's the beliefs that don't fit reality and that even though there's a bunch of evidence saying that they aren't true, people still continue to believe. Hallucinations, on the other hand, are perceptual experiences um, that are out of the ordinary. The most common kind of hallucination in schizophrenia is auditory hallucinations. Um, visual hallucinations are, are relatively common as well, but auditory uh, is the most common. So people generally hear voices for their auditory hallucinations, um, and sometimes it's people they know, sometimes it's strangers, sometimes it's men, women, um, sometimes there's sort of a consistent one or two voices, other times the voices vary um, quite a bit. A really interesting thing about auditory hallucinations is when people with schizophrenia are in an fMRI machine that's sort of measuring brain activation. Uh, if in the fMRI machine they hear voices, they hallucinate, um, their auditory cortex actually becomes active. It, it lights up in the same way uh, that it would if someone without schizophrenia um, had someone talking to them, like physically talking to them. And so this image here shows the auditory cortex um, lighting up. Uh, and I think it's really fascinating because there's kind of this question of how much do people's um, auditory hallucinations actually sound real to them? And this is evidence that the answer might be pretty real. Um, it's not just like having a song stuck in your head that you know is internally generated. It seems to really sound um, similar to how anyone uh, hears any, any other sound. 
I'm going to play a clip. Um, I'm just going to play a few seconds of it. Uh, it is a little bit distressing. Um, what it is, is it's a compilation of um, people, researchers put this together based on what people with schizophrenia um, reported uh, their auditory hallucinations sounded like. And so this video is believed to um, kind of mimic what it might be like to hear voices. So I'll just play, uh, you know, 40 seconds or so of it. And think as you're listening to it, what it would be like to hear these sounds in your head while you're trying to go about and do your day and get things done. You are so stupid. Look at you. Jump in now. Jump in front of the car. Go on. Go on. Do it. Do it. No, no, no. Don't. Don't. Don't cross the road. You can't. So stupid. Look at you. Stupid. Stupid. Pointless. Touch you. Worthless. Stupid. Yes, you were. All right. So, um, like I said, just a short, short clip of it. But imagine if that was the kind of thing you were hearing off and on all day. I think it really uh, helps us empathize with people that have auditory hallucinations to imagine that it would be hard to get things done. And like you heard in this clip, often people report that these voices are mean. They're not generally saying things like, you've got this, you're the best, you can do it. Um, they might be telling you you're stupid, you're a loser, you're no good. Um, they might be what are called command hallucinations, telling you jump in front of the car, kill yourself. Um, so they're not generally saying pleasant things as what patients describe. Um, so yeah, it could be really tough to, to hear that all day. The next set of symptoms are disorganized speech and behavior. Um, and that is sort of acting or speaking in an erratic way. Um, and uh, so notably, I think it's around 60% or so of the street homeless population is estimated to have schizophrenia. It's a really, really high um, proportion. Uh, and so sometimes the erratic behavior that we might see um, if we walk by someone who appears to be street homeless um, could be accounted for by schizophrenia. Uh, and so it's maybe, you know, speaking and in incomplete sentences, stringing words together that don't make sense. Um, it might be sort of like, moving, moving in, a, in an erratic way, um, pacing around a lot, uh, not from anxiety, um, but just a, as a form of disorganized behavior. So that's kind of a, a, that's what that set of symptoms refers to. And then finally in schizophrenia, we have what are called the negative symptoms. And so that's sort of like a, a lack of typical behaviors. So common examples include uh, a lack of motivation, which is called avolition, um, where people might have a really hard time kind of getting up out of bed, out the door to a job, um, could also be uh, blunted affect, um, where people just aren't showing much emotion at all, people with schizophrenia, um, could also come out in terms of um, being really monotone, that's considered a negative symptom. A lot of people with schizophrenia might talk like this, where their, their tone isn't really going up and down, it's just sort of flat. Um, so that would be uh, another example of a negative symptom. Uh, as one other example of disorganized behavior, just to go back, um, emotion that doesn't match the situation would be another example of that. So while telling a really sad story, someone might burst out laughing. Um, that would be kind of a feature uh, of disorganized behavior. So schizophrenia, as mentioned, it's highly heritable. Um, to break that down for you, generally in, in the U.S., about 1% of people have schizophrenia, 1 in 100. If you have a first degree relative, you have a 10% chance of having schizophrenia. So first degree relative meaning um, a parent, child, or sibling. Um, if you have an identical twin with schizophrenia, you've got about a 40 to 50% chance. So there are pairs of identical twins um, where one has schizophrenia and the other doesn't, it certainly happens. However, it really does increase um, the risk if your identical twin uh, has it as well. Um, however, this is not to say that there's something like one schizophrenia gene, right? It's considered to be a disorder of polygenic influence. So a bunch of different genetic er variants each have a small effect and combined they contribute to this elevated risk for schizophrenia. Um, that said, environment does still matter. A couple examples of how it matters. So um, babies who are born in the spring where most of their fetal development occurred 
in the winter, they have a higher incidence of schizophrenia, which is thought to be um, because of illnesses that the mother might contract during fetal development. Um, and then uh, another example of how environment uh, matters is that um, people with schizophrenia have generally a worse prognosis and more severe presentation um, in the West. So like in the US and Europe um, versus in uh, the East, like East Asia, uh, as well as Africa. People in those countries um, with schizophrenia, uh, they have a better prognosis. It's not as severe. They're generally able to do more things on their own, live more independently. Um, and there are a bunch of kind of cultural explanations for why that might be. But it's just another example of how um, environment does matter, even in this very highly heritable, highly genetic-based disorder. Uh, there's uh, what's called the dopamine hypothesis to explain how we develop schizophrenia or where it accounts for it. Um, we think that people with schizophrenia have an overactive dopamine system. Dopamine is another neurotransmitter, just like serotonin, um, that's released in the brain. Uh, and in line with the dopamine hypothesis, schizophrenia has got this really interesting inverse relationship with Parkinson's. Um, so uh, Parkinson's is, is, you know, of course, a disorder where uh, trembling is a, is a common symptom of it. So when we treat Parkinson's, we're generally giving people levodopa, which ups the amount of dopamine in their system. And a side effect of levodopa is sometimes psychotic symptoms. On the flip side, when we treat psychosis, when we treat schizophrenia, um, we're trying to decrease the amount of dopamine in the system. Um, and when we give people antipsychotic medication, it does that. However, then a side effect of antipsychotic medication, it can be Parkinsonian-like tremors. Um, like this is a video of a patient who does not have Parkinson's but was prescribed antipsychotics and went on to develop a slight tremor. You have to look kind of closely to see. You can see that hand is shaking, um, which seems to be kind of an effect of, of blunting the dopamine system to try and treat schizophrenia. So sort of just an interesting uh, neurotransmitter explanation of this disorder. Okay, so this brings us to our last uh, disorder that we'll do our crash course on OCD. Um, so I'll start by showing you a video. Uh, this is from the movie As Good As It Gets, which people might be familiar with. Um, the main character, Jack Nicholson, has OCD. Uh, this will just show him exhibiting some of his symptoms. And without even necessarily knowing what the symptoms of OCD are, type into chat as you watch this uh, how, how you see the three Ds um, in, in this little clip. So for example, how might you expect these symptoms to cause dysfunction for Jack Nicholson's character? How might they cause him distress? Okay, I guess dysfunction and distress are the ones to focus on. All right, so we'll go ahead and play. seconds to type into chat, focus on dysfunction. How would the symptoms you just observed mess things up for him? Whether it's job or relationships or anything like that. Let's see what people think. Yeah, time completing the task, right? He's going to be slow at everything. That's going to delay a bunch of things. Maybe getting to work on time, maybe being on time for dates, um, spend a lot on soap. Yeah, it might have, uh, it might cause dysfunction in terms of his finances. A waste of resources, yet unable to focus on a task. Yeah, definitely. I think those could all be ways that his symptoms interfere and cause dysfunction for him. 
So what is OCD? So OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, it's kind of the combination of the two words in its name. So you've got obsessions, um, which are any intrusive thought, image, or impulse um, that generally uh, isn't wanted, isn't in line with how someone sees themselves and causes them distress. So in Jack Nicholson's case, um, perhaps his intrusive thoughts, likely his intrusive thoughts, were about germs or contamination or dirt, which is a really common manifestation of OCD. Compulsions, on the other hand, are any repetitive behavior, um, generally unobservable behavior, uh, but they might also be a repetitive mental act. And the compulsions, what they do is they reduce uh, the distress from the obsessions. So Jack Nicholson's compulsions that we noticed, um, so flipping the light switch, uh, washing his hands, using gloves, um, using really scalding hot water, having that kind of whole hand washing routine. And so generally compulsions are aimed at reducing the distress that the obsessions generate. So if I'm really worried about germs and dirt, but then I wash my hands for a really long time with really hot water, then I feel better temporarily because it's kind of reduced that concern about germs and dirt. As you might expect, I'll side note, contamination OCD, uh, sort of the treatment for it um, and, the, and diagnosing it and everything has really changed in COVID times. Um, but in general, uh, it is certainly possible to have a dysfunctional level of um, using gloves and hand washing and things like that. It can really mess things up for people. So there, given, given that compulsions are generally meant to reduce distress from obsessions, there are a few common obsession compulsion pairings that we see in OCD. So this one we just talked about, um, but also there might be um, people have obsessive doubts like that I'm gonna burn down my house or someone's gonna break in. So that might lead me to have the compulsion of checking the stove over and over or the locks or the appliances to make sure I didn't leave anything on. Um, a lot of people have intrusive thoughts about harming a loved one intentionally, like I might pick up this knife and stab somebody. Um, so that might lead me to do a compulsion like clenching my fists when I'm around knives so that I don't, don't do that. Um, harming someone because they're not being careful enough, like an accidental hit and run is another example. Uh, that might mean when I'm driving, I'm constantly checking the rearview mirror to make sure, did I hit someone? Am I sure? I might even loop back on my route on my way to work. I might have to circle back many times to make sure I didn't hit anyone before I feel like I can keep going. Intrusive sexual images is kind of another um, common form of OCD um, that might go along with mentally reviewing my actions. You know, did I touch that child inappropriately? Let me try and remember. Let me think about it. I might also try and think neutralizing thoughts to myself like, you know, if I have an unwanted um, sexual thought, try and replace it with a more neutralizing thought in my head. Um, and then yeah, an example, uh, needing to do something just right in order to prevent bad things. Like if everything isn't lined up in a certain way, my mom's going to be in a car accident. Um, I might also, you know, do everyday activities nine times, go in and out of every door nine times. And with sort of this thought that if I don't, then something bad will happen. I have to do things just right in order to prevent a bad thing. Um, so this is just a smattering of different obsession compulsion pairings that we see. As you're probably getting a sense of, um, there's a really wide range of uh, obsessions and compulsions that we see in OCD. Um, this is just sort of a, a selection of a few of them. The way that we treat OCD um, is also through CBT. Uh, the type of CBT that we use is called exposure and response prevention. So the exposure part is you are actually trying to trigger the obsessive thought. Um, the response prevention part is then preventing the compulsion. So an ERP session for contamination fear might look like you touch something dirty and then you try and prevent yourself from washing your hands so that you sort of learn that you can tolerate the distress um, from uh, doing that thing and, and not washing your hands. Um, if you have obsessive doubts that you might cause a fire, you're trying to actually picture burning your house down and resist that urge to go back and check the stove over and over again so you learn that you can tolerate the distress without checking the stove um, and you can handle it and you don't need to fall back on your compulsions. Um, stabbing a loved one is a really interesting kind of ERP um, where people will actually uh, do exercises like um, if someone has an intrusive thought that they might stab someone, they actually might uh, hold scissors to their therapist's neck and sit with that. And again, it's all about learning the, to tolerate the distress. And also in that case, learning that you aren't going to do the thing that you have intrusive fears about doing. Um, happy to talk more about ERP. I think it sounds counterintuitive often to people, um, but it works really, really well. Um, 
Okay, so that uh, kind of concludes um, my, my talk about these different disorders. Um, OCD, uh, just to, to kind of wrap up and segue um, into a, a shameless plug, um, OCD is related to also a disorder called hoarding disorder, which people might be familiar with from shows like Hoarders, um, although I think that really stigmatizes the population, um, but it is basically having way too much clutter in your home. Uh, it is comorbid with OCD, it's, it's sort of related. Uh, and at Stanford, I am running a clinical trial to examine a new intervention for hoarding disorder. So if anyone here listening um, or a loved one that you have struggles with clutter, um, we're looking for participants um, of all ages, but there are sort of more options for those over age 55. Um, so if you or a loved one struggles with clutter, uh, if their house you know, looks something like this picture, um, there's an opportunity to have uh, access to a 16-week peer support group where um, you will learn skills uh, related to reducing clutter, throwing things out, as well as 10 individual virtual reality sessions with a clinician. So this is the part that we're sort of most interested in testing. We've developed a virtual reality treatment where people can basically, uh, we make an individualized world for each participant. Um, they will then practice in VR throwing out their items with the hope being that it makes it easier to throw out their actual items um, in real life. So it's both this peer support group as well as the individual VR sessions. There's no cost to participate. Um, if this does strike anyone's interest, they think they know someone who might be interested, they can email clutterhelp at stanford.edu uh, and they can get you set up um, for an interview to determine um, if you or someone you know might be eligible for it. So that's clutterhelp at stanford.edu. Um, they'd also be happy to answer any more questions that you have about this study. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a pretty cool application of virtual reality to, um, to try and treat uh, this really debilitating disorder. So clutterhelp at stanford.edu. All right, and that is the end of, of what I wanted to, to chat with you guys about. Um, my email is hannah.rila at stanford.edu. Um, feel free to jot it down. Let me know if you have questions. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you, Dr. Rila. That was great. Uh, yes, thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's yeah. see the questions. Um, I think we have one in the chat. Um, yeah, I see that one. So yeah, okay. So is PTSD a mental illness? Yes, it is. Um, it used to be classified as an anxiety disorder. Now it's in its own sort of section on trauma and related disorders, um, but it certainly is. And as you can imagine, uh, criteria for it are exposure to a trauma. So whether that's witnessing a murder or being raped or a variety of traumatic things, um, and then people kind of can't stop re-experiencing that. Uh, they might feel like they have flashbacks to it. Um, they might, you know, break out into a sweat when something reminds them of it. Um, those are common symptoms of it. But yes, absolutely, it's a it's a mental illness. Good question. Let's see if we have any other question. Why are nervous breakdowns not in the DSM? Um, so that's an interesting question. So the, the DSM does include uh, panic attacks. It describes panic attacks, which um, it, it's basically the sudden onset of a bunch of physiological symptoms. So you might be going about your day feeling more or less okay. Then all of a sudden it's your heart's racing, you feel dizzy, you're sweating, you're trembling. Um, and it's kind of a zero to 60 experience like that. So that is a panic attack, um, which the DSM does include. Uh, there is then a disorder called panic disorder, where basically if you are really worried about having another panic attack and it's really changing your behavior, um, that could be considered uh, a disorder. So we don't call it a nervous breakdown, um, but a panic attack might be capturing um, what uh, some people are getting at when they describe a nervous breakdown. And let's see, what are the solutions offered for hoarding? Um, so hoarding, uh, like um, depression and OCD, which we talked about, is uh, relatively amenable to cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Um, and so a lot of what that is, is it's providing people uh, skills that can help them discard their items. So a big one there is noticing um, what people's thoughts are about their items. So it, for some people, 
Uh, they have a hard time letting go of items because they might have the thought, maybe one day this will be useful. For other people, it's a part of their identity. If I throw out this paint set, you know, that doesn't align with my identity as an artist. Um, other people might be worried about their memory. If I, uh, you know, move these bills out of sight, I'll forget to pay them. Um, and so people, people can have sort of a, a range of how distorted the thoughts about the items are. Um, for example, if I have had a broken microwave for 20 years and I'm thinking I could fix it up and sell it on eBay, but I haven't, that's sort of getting into a more distorted type of thought about that item. Um, and so noticing those kinds of thoughts is, is a big part of it. Uh, and then trying to sort of talk back to them um, is big as well. Another component uh, of the typical approach for hoarding um, is practicing throwing things out that are first relatively easier to discard. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe I've been saving like my favorite restaurant for five years and that feels kind of easy to throw out. So, but maybe I predict it's going to be um, really difficult and I'll be thinking about it. But I would start with throwing out that relatively easier item, track how I feel, hopefully notice that I'm not actually as upset as I thought I might be. Um, and then sort of build up to throwing out uh, more and more difficult items to, um, to part with. So those are two of the main approaches to it. Um, let's see. With COVID, many people who've never had disorders before are experiencing them now. Thoughts on how to deal with these thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. I think COVID has really, you know, I, and I'll be very curious to see what the stats are on this once we have a better grasp on it. But I would be quite surprised if there's not a general uptick in a lot of mental illnesses, um, certainly across the country, perhaps across the world. Um, and I think the way it's affecting people really ranges. I think um, a higher incidence of depression is, is really common, largely because the isolation that we're having to do with quarantine uh, can affect people really, really negatively. The sort of lack of a schedule, um, lack of things that are getting people up and out the door and motivated, that can be really, really hard for people, especially if they're at risk for depression. But even if they've never been depressed before, it is the kind of scenario that could, um, you know, make it more likely to develop depression um, in, these, in these really trying times. Um, and also just sort of anxiety about uh, contamination. Um, of course, we sort of want some anxiety so that we do, we take appropriate safety precautions, but if people's heads are really running away with them, um, they're, you know, having a hard time leaving the bedroom because of fear of getting contaminated with COVID, that's kind of a, a different level. Um, but yeah, so the, the part of this question, thoughts on how to deal, how to deal with this, um, seek mental health care. If you think that you or someone you know needs professional help, um, look for a therapist, uh, look for a psychiatrist. I know that the healthcare system makes that pretty hard to do. Um, I always recommend using psychology today as a pretty good way of finding therapists and they have ways of, of sorting therapists by um, your uh, insurance company that you have. Um, but yeah, therapy, therapy works. And I think we've mentioned already a few times CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, for a lot of kind of disorders that are depression and anxiety related at least. Um, CBT is the gold standard, it works the best. So specifically, I recommend looking, if you're interested in therapy, looking for uh, CBT providers. Um, yeah, so those are some thoughts about that. But I know COVID's tough, for sure. And we have um, two more questions in the Q&A uh, uh, bar. Do you see them? Yeah, okay, so uh, what are the causes of hoarding? What are the general ther therapies for that? So we went over a little bit already, the, the therapeutic approaches for it. Um, causes of hoarding, you know, hoarding is a relatively less understood disorder in ways like that um, because it actually wasn't added to the DSM. We talked about adding and subtracting things. It wasn't added to the DSM until the version that came out in 2013, um, DSM-5. So it was really only beginning in 2013 that people have kind of studied hoarding disorder as its own uh, category. And so we don't, for example, have as good a grasp on how genetically heritable it is compared to other disorders um, and, and kind of about the causes of it uh, in general. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, we're still kind of learning about, about the causes there. And then let's see, another question, are procrastination, fatigue, and burnout part of disorders? And if so, any treatment for that? Um, good question. So they, they certainly can be. I, 
this kind of makes me think of the three D's that we talked about. So, of course, procrastination, fatigue, and burnout, those are all things that we experience. Everyone experiences somewhere along a, the spectrum. Um, and we change as, as time goes on and as different things happen in our life, we might change sort of where we fall on that spectrum. So the fact that someone's procrastinating, fatigued, and feeling burned out, doesn't necessarily mean that they have a disorder by any means. They might just be kind of in the normative part of the spectrum there. Um, uh, however, you know, generally for disorders, especially depressive and anxiety ones, um, people are going to feel distressed. Um, fatigue specifically is a, is a really common symptom of depression. Um, and I think procrastination can come from a bunch of things. One possible thing it can come from is kind of this lack of motivation, um, lack of enjoying things that people used to enjoy. If they used to get satisfaction from completing work tasks, but don't anymore, that could be linked to depression. Um, so, you know, my summary answer to that question is it depends. Sometimes those things might be indicative of a disorder. Other times they might just be sort of, um, you know, parts of normal parts of the uh, human experience. All good questions, guys. Okay, I think uh, we answered all the questions. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rayla. Um, and all um, attendees, I just um, sent the link for the library event calendar. And also I am sharing another link. If you like this, uh, talk if you want to see more of these or similar or other topics please um, uh, send us suggestions comments on this link I shared uh, thank you dr. Rayla for the great pr presentation um, yeah thanks for having me thanks another time in future yeah thanks everyone thanks for listening have a good evening all right Hi, everyone. Bye.